Welcome back to the Chronicle, the official film podcast for the People's Movies. My name is Paul, I'm your host and editor of the People's Movies. I do welcome to this long-awaited episode 31, and if you obviously love movies, you're in the right place. So, as ever, Clotilde Tenici is my host, and hello Clotilde, how are you? Hello, I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great, there's obviously a lot of things have happened since we last done an episode, that's episode 30, well, we'll tell you about them with uh, episodes, but it's just been a little summer recess for you, and I believe you went to, you've done Cannes and even uh, Sundance London during a little period of time we were off. Yeah, so I kind of did them back to back actually, which is intense, but yeah. um, yes, I went to Cannes at the end of May, I want to say, and then Sundance yeah. London was just at the beginning of this month. Yeah. Yeah, maybe if you want to chat about them uh, after we've done the two reviews, that'll be great if you can. Okay, so uh, other things that's happened uh, since we've done the last episode, the Chronicle is now part of Podbean. Because of that, Podbean, uh, it means we're on, you will find us in other popular places to get your podcasts, like Apple, that's that's a big one for us, Amazon Music, you name it. I'll name it, some of them at the end uh, at the end of the episode. So there might be little things uh, in between the way we do it, and that might sound slightly different. Because it's just all new stuff for us, new stuff is to use, get into our, our partner again. So for this week, we've got two films. Um, we've got a film that's on Netflix, that's The Hitman, that's Richard Linklater's film. We do have a film that's in the cinemas, and that's the long-awaited Inside Out 2. And the first review for this week, that's episode 31 of The Chronicle, is Richard Linklater's Hitman, which is... You might still find it in some UK cinemas and Irish cinemas, but it's now on Netflix. The main star for this film, Glenn Powell, and he stars as Gary Johnson. And he lives a very simple singles life with his his little cat, his birds and his cats. And he lives in the leafy suburbs, New Orleans. He's actually a teacher uh, at the local university, he teaches psychology. And in the opening scene, you get to see his good electronics and a lot of things, that, a lot of other little things. But most of all, what we do learn about him, he supplements his income by working undercover for the, the New Orleans Police Department. At the beginning, we get to see little bits of his life here and there, just to let us see how he is and what type of character he is. And then we get to see him in his job, his supplement job with the police. In a, his life sort of turns upside down when he's asked to go undercover as a contract killer or aka a hitman. Obviously at the beginning, Gary's very reluctant to obviously do this, but he tries it for the first time as someone called Billy. That was his cover name for, because the person who usually does it, that's Jasper. He's, he's like sort of suspended. That's Oster Emilio. He's, a, he's another regular like Glenn Paul for a lot of the Richard Linklater films. But a lot of people might know him as Dwight in the, the Walking Dead franchise. So the first job for Gary, he gets he's, he's very natural, very professional, very convincing and very successful. By each job, Gary actually starts to get a lot better and deep down, and he goes deeper down the rabbit hole. Now things are changing a, a lot for him and his persona. Even a lot of things uh, happening here is it's just absolute crazy. Some of the jobs he gets asked to do, People are offering him speedboats, like a speedboat in Miami Vice. And then it comes to one person, is Madison, who's played by Adria Arijona, who appears on the scene to enlist Gary's help. Slowly, Gary does get attracted to her. Madison, he's called Ron. And and what Madison is, she's she's fleeing her, what she's saying is her abusive husband, who's breaking this sort of protocol. So when they first meet, the first thing he says to her, he meet her in a like, your sort of American style cafe. He says, All pie is good pie. You know, the hitman itself. I don't know about you, uh, Clotilda. There's been films down down the line. People are assuming for the title they're gonna get like a serial killer or a hitman type movie, you know, like you know, an action type movie. And there's a lot of films down the line, not necessarily it go, it's a negative towards the movie, but it doesn't mean to say the movie is negative. And I think a lot of people get in think this is going to be a hit, like a, a crime thriller, and it's a miss sells the film. I liked Hitman, I don't know about you, 
it's not an action thriller that some people are all suspecting. There's not really any action. It may be an odd little bit of action. It. Yeah, it is a thriller. But I think The Hitman is more of a romance, even a screwball comedy, as much as it is a drama and as much as it's a procedural drama noir. And obviously for the procedural uh, crime drama side of things, a little scene throughout the film, you get to see Gary or whatever character he is uh, in the film at, at a court and the characters, who, the people who he's actually trying to prosecute up against, up against uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, getting charged for the crimes that they've done. But the big clue is at the front, at the beginning of the movie, where it, uh, I, I think comes up saying, what you're about to see is somewhat of a true story. And then dot, 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 inspired by the life of Gary Johnson. Yep, Gary Johnson was an actual person. He was an ex, if I remember rightly, for the, the research done, he's an ex Vietnam soldier. So obviously he has a bit of his skills with the guns and things there. But he's a very intellectual person, but he's also a very quiet. Is that, is that introvert? I think he's very introvert as well. You know, Madison or Arjona, she's she's like a classic femme fatale. Very troubled, very mysterious lady who sort of, sort of introduces her man to do her dirty, wa- her dirty washing. I love this movie. Well, not in the sense of I really liked it. I, I really enjoyed it. You know what? I mean, Clotilde, when they go rom-coms, I've seen as, as people like to, some people like to call it chick flicks. I think this is a rom-com that it's not just for the ladies, but it's also for the guys as well. Also, the ladies will have the, the eye candy of Glenn Pill, who I've actually met. I met him in Glasgow with Austin Amelia. Really? Yeah, the, oh, forget the name of the film. It was a film that came out about 10 years ago. It was, oh, so one, it's a bit like the sort of Days Can Confuse type movie. Oh, the name, the name is Ed, Edge of Mark. I do apologise for not getting the name of it. And they, they did a little tour around the UK, like London, Manchester, I think Birmingham and Glasgow. And <laughs> if anyone knows Scotland, uh, one of, well, obviously our national drink is uh, Iron Brew, but one of our other national drinks is Tenants Lager, and that gets brewed in uh, Glasgow. And so they did a, a Q&A, meet, get together with the fans in the, the centre, in the centre, which is in the Tenants, and let's just say, what a time. I don't think any of us, including the guys for the film and Richard Linkler, left that place uh, sober. What did you think of the film? I also liked it. I think you're right. It's a bit of like a rom-com with like a tiny bit of action and thriller. I think it's really fun because it's kind of like, it's all of these genres, but at the same time, it's none of them. Like, it's not really what you expect from a traditional yeah. rom-com or from a traditional action film. Which I think is why it feels really fresh. Like there are so many films that just overuse the same tropes over and over, which you yeah. know can be fun if you like the genre. But I think with Hitman, it just feels like every scene is is new and everything that you see, like it just pushes the narrative a bit differently, which I really enjoyed because you know it's a thriller. It's meant to keep you, you know, on the edge of your seat. So I I thought that was very good, and I think the star of the movie is obviously Glenn Powell. Like he's just Oh, he's just so good. Like I think this film relies a lot on the way that he just changes depending on like who's he acting against and like what part of his life in a way uh he's in because he's leading like this kind of double life. And I really enjoyed how he portrayed that. Like there was one of the scenes at the beginning, like when he's talking to the guy when he gets the hitman job and he's talking to this first guy and then he walks out of the face the diner and he wears glasses and even something just like that tiny you can tell it is a complete switch of characters and of acting like the minute he gets the glasses on he's acting like one character yeah. or Gary and the, the minute the glasses are off he's acting like another and it's it's really cool to see because some of those are like really subtle changes but he really shows them I think quite well and even the bigger changes like he's he's so good at kind of like playing with that as well I think I think he was having a lot of fun it looks like <laughs> so I think I, I just really enjoyed that and he's to me he's what makes the film work the most as well because it does rely a lot on his performance and you know he has to make it believable and I think he really does so credit to him yeah yeah he really does make it and there's even a bit I'm not spoiling any even a bit near the end a couple of female students says I didn't realize your teacher's so hot 
<laughs> yeah. You know, that, that shows you how much uh, uh, different he was, because when you seen him, see him a bit at the beginning, he was a bit of a, a bookworm, if you like to say, yeah. you know, when the, at the beginning we see his teacher side of things, and gradually yeah. he's coming out, out of his shell, if you like, like his shell, suddenly he's a completely different character by the end. I mean, it does, uh, the, the film, Richard Linklater does well open up a few questions about identity, but also yeah. it, it shows how, how deep down the rabbit hole did he actually go? Did he get through more than one rabbit hole? Because obviously uh, Ron, uh, his character Ron and uh, Madison become love, lovers, and then you can generally see they do love each other. But both of them also had a little sense of mystery between them. You don't know, are, yeah. they, are, they, are they actually being genuinely convinced, you know, genuine with the saying? I'm not spoiling anything. There is, at the end, there's a few unexpected twists. And this is when the film gets a bit a bit crazy. Uh, there has been a few people who say it's, that, it's that disappointing. Yeah, the film does dip a little bit at the beginning, but I had to do that to sort of explain how things were going on as well. And I think also, that, 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 as I said before, I think a lot of people don't realise this is actually based on a real person. But the mm. clue is right at the very beginning inspired uh, yeah. by a story of the real mm. person. I tell there was a lot of close calls because there's one point we do meet Madison's husband and, and then when Madison is out with Ron, uh, some of uh, Gary's colleagues, especially Jasper, and, you know, that, that sort of thing. No, you're right, Glenn Paul's excellent. And I think, he, as you said, he's, he's starting to showcase himself as one of the upcoming Hollywood leading men. Could, I mean, I know this is a predominantly a Netflix release, it's a film I think you could easily... Could you see that's doing just as well on the big screen than it is a Netflix film? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So I did actually watch it on Netflix. So I didn't... I did too, I didn't yeah. see it in the cinema. But I I do think, like, I, I do appreciate that, like, they did this um, release in the theatres, even though it wasn't massive. Like, I think it was, like, only there for a week or so, at least the ones for me. In a way, I'm kind of glad that they did, because a lot of things tend to just go straight to streaming with Netflix. But at the yeah. same time, it's hard to say, because before, like, watching it, before knowing it was on Netflix, it meant to me that didn't sound like, you know, the classic Netflix movie. I think, I don't know, I think people go on Netflix for other stuff. Um, yeah. In other ways, then, I, I suppose it could be, because this kind of mixture of genres is what, may make it more appealing to like a wider audience which in that case i do see why it could be natural because you can watch it like with your friends that don't necessarily like film or yeah. action movies but at the same time i think it's one of those films where like you do want to push for a wider maybe theatrical release i think when you have like especially a star like Glenn powell like he was just in a really big movie which was anyone but you and there's a lot of like fairly big names I know they're like not maybe A-listers yet but like yeah these people have a sort of following right and I think that would have probably showed in a wider theatrical release like there's probably other places like you know I'm in London there's probably other cities where it was even harder to see it in cinemas I feel like that's kind of the issue with Netflix usually for me like it's also like when you know it's like in the cinemas and then next week it's going to be on Netflix like who's really going to go to the cinema if we're being honest so there's there's a bit of that I think, but I do see why it would be on such a big platform because I do see the appeal to like various target audiences, which I think is something that Netflix kind of stands for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the film also came a big sort of hyper ball, you know, because uh, it premiered. I'm not. It premiered at, at the BFI London Film Festival last <laughs> last year, and it was one of the films that a lot of the critics from around the world who came to London who loved it and yeah. and, it, and it made itself such a hyper ball and I was just like that oh, uh, did I believe the hype here because yeah. a lot of the folks were pushing it above like I said it's pedestal I mean yeah. don't get me wrong it's not a masterpiece and it's not a terrible film it's a very good film it's a very highly entertaining film and obviously the other, pro- the other thing was a lot of the early reviews it hmm. did say we did have a highly entertaining film on the cards, including the one that is on at the People's Movies from uh, Frida Cooper, who reviewed it for the website. A way back, a way back then, and I've just recently, I think, 
last week when it came out on Netflix, I reposted it again. Yeah, I really liked it. And the chemistry between Arjona and Pau was very, very good. Yeah. It's very, very good. As, as we said, it's got a lot of genres in it. And some people were saying it, it felt it's three, maybe even three different films. And and it it never felt they were all sewn together. It actually felt naturally between them. It felt they were all one movie, which I really, really liked. You know, it was funny at times. It was obviously dramatic. And as I said previously, how far down the rabbit hole did Gle- Gle- well, Gary sorry, actually go? I found it a very, it was silly, it was a very sharp-witted film. And what did you think, your final thoughts on the uh, on the Hitman? Yeah, I also liked how, like, um, from a narrative point of view, because there's a few scenes of him teaching. Yeah. And I think at first you're kind of, like, not sure where this thing's going. Like, sure, it's showing us, like, Gary and his, like, life as a teacher. But I thought it was really interesting how the um, kind of philosophical element about identity will yeah. come back like his classes for like his kind of double life and I thought that was a good way of integrating both because otherwise I think it would be easy to feel like the sequences are very separate but I think the fact that like there's always a reference and sometimes it's more obvious that in the scenes where he's teaching about like Nietzsche and Freud it's a bit more obvious where they're going with the parallel but some other times I think it's quite subtle and I think it's very interesting to kind of like try and see the movie as you know from the point of like if you were a student in Gary's class if that makes sense like yeah I thought it was very interesting when he was speaking about Freud and he was speaking like about the id ego and super ego where I was like, oh, always forget the name but um and you can see kind of like how in a very simplistic way but like those philosophical concepts can be kind of paralleled in Gary's like own life as he's teaching it and I I think that's quite a nice touch too make the movie feel more cohesive because otherwise it just starts a bit separate and so from a writing point of view I also think the, the movie was very good. Yep so what rate did you give this film? I gave it a three and a half because I mean it's good but I also don't think it's like you know the best of the year or like the one I'm gonna remember the most. Yeah I'm the exact same I gave it three and a half out of five I totally mm-hmm. uh, as I said it had its I had some very good moments I had uh, some little moments, uh, m- m- moments, but yeah. had a lot, a lot, I had enough in it to be entertaining. Just basically grab your munchies, or in this case, in the Hitman, just grab a slice of pie. So there yes. you have it. <laughs> yep, <laughs> there you have it, folks. That's three and a half out of five from both of us for the Hitman. And we um, next review and final review for episode 31 of The Chronicle. It's Disney Pixar's Inside Out 2. Clotilda, would you like to tell us about the film and what have you thought of it and if you liked it or didn't like it? Yeah, so Inside Out 2 kind of begins in a way right after Inside Out where we got to know Riley, who's the main character, and yep. the emotions that populate our head. So in the first film and at the beginning of the second, it's joy, sadness, anger, fear and disgust. At the beginning of the second film, Riley's 12, so she's uh, going through puberty, which understandably changes her whole brain, which we see the inside of. So it starts it starts out with like these five emotions, but then others show up. And one of the most important ones, maybe, or the center character, I would say, is anxiety, which just shows up <laughs> with all the new emotions like embarrassment, ennui, which was one of my favorites. Yeah, <laughs> I, like, that's just great. <laughs> I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I like I like that. Just lying yeah. over the couch, lazy. <laughs> yeah, love it, and and obviously envy as well. So with obviously puberty, there's all these new emotions that come in the headquarters, and understandably they kind of struggle to understand how to help Riley in the best way between the new emotions and the old emotions and especially anxiety who really wants to control everything and all the possible outcomes and as Riley goes to this camp for hockey because if you remember from the previous film as well she really liked to play hockey she's kind of faced with these decisions about whether she wants to stay with her old friends or stay with the newer like kind of cooler high school people and obviously there's a lot of pressure on her to prove herself and then maybe get into the team for the high school which she's going to go to in the following year. And I, I, I really like it. I always like Inside Out. Like, even the first one, yeah. I was a big fan. 
And I think it's a very good sequel because, first of all, I think it's really cool that they decided to set it during like puberty. And it's good because it allows them to have new emotions, which I think makes it more fun. Like for those of us that like remember the first one very well, I think it would have been risky to show the same kind of patterns and relationships between the emotions. But I think done this way makes more sense to me in the sense that like we're discovering another side of her mind. And there's a lot of like new things as well from the plot. Like there's a whole belief system that we didn't see in the first film. So it feels like a way of, exploring the mind even more which I thought was really cool and I also liked like the like the drawings and the animation I feel like something that Inside Out does really well yeah. is how each emotion looks different like I don't know I think even without knowing who is who if you see a picture you would immediately know like who anxiety is and who disgust is and I think that's really cool from like a design and animation point of view because I mean it might be so hard like they're all so unique and then at the same time Something that I also really like is that obviously it's all focused on Riley, but then we also see like some snippets of like her mother and her father. It's kind of cool how the emotions change physically in a way to fit the parents as well and her friends. I think from, from like that side, they obviously did so much work and it's, it's just beautiful to watch. Like it just gives you kind of like a insider look into her, like a kid's mind and that's amazing and like the things they come up with like one of my favorites I don't think it's a spoiler like when there's a parade of careers and like I thought that was so fun it's just feels like so realistic in a way to those years I think a lot of films make it seem not simple but like they don't really show the complexity of like puberty and being a teenager and I think Inside Out does that really well and I actually read that they had actual teenagers like as the movie was being developed and as they were like going and writing mm-hmm. to like come in I think it was either monthly or weekly but there was just kind of like comments on whether they thought it was realistic or like especially for how the emotions acted and I thought that was really cool because the authenticity that you feel in this film is probably down to that the fact they had like a group of teenagers to actually yeah. assess because it is about like who's gonna know better um but yes I also really like all the voice actors I think everybody did such an excellent job because the emotions are very clear not just from the design but also from their voice like like I said I know it's fantastic like just from the tone of voice you immediately know what everybody stands for and I think that makes it even more fun but yeah I was I really liked it I think it's a very fitting sequel and conclusion. Not conclusion, not conclusion. I don't know if they'll do another one <laughs> of yeah. the Inside Out like saga. And I think it was important in a way to show like this age of being a teenager because in many ways I think the ground like the first film was kind of groundbreaking in yeah. like showing how sadness was with joy and all of that. But there's so much more that it can comment on, and I think this this film really showed that to me. Yeah. I, I really liked it. I actually didn't expect to like it this much. I was a bit worried that it would maybe like repeat too much from the previous film, like in terms of like character arc. Because obviously like you do know that the emotions are gonna symbolize the same thing. Yeah. But I think they did a good job in making it not feel like the exact copy, but also very much within the same universe and atmosphere. Yep, you're right. I enjoyed it as well. As in inside out. You know, that's 2015 the first movie came out. So if they were going, if they were actually going with the, the times, as in uh, what the age Riley was in the first film to the age she will now, I think she might have been, she might be turning some like 16, 17, 18, you know, and that would be another. Oh, I think about that. Yeah, that would be another type of uh, emotions as well. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's not the same level as the original film. Yeah. But that's not a negative. Uh, and if there was, as the, 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 the obviously they did, so we're going to make the second film, it had to be in Riley's puberty or into her adolescence as well. Because and, and I liked also how they showed little snippets of her, of her when she was a young young kid, bringing yeah. in the pou- pouchy, that little things, the, the computer games, the little set of computer games, the little things that little girls liked, the little toys, the little set of things for her hair or whatever. Uh, other little things and I also liked how uh, she just went to bed and then she woke up yeah <laughs> she smells her underarm oh what the what is that you know and then suddenly the emotions just hit her just like like it did for us all you know 
and 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 then and her mum comes in going, what's what's going on? What's going on? And and she actually starts screaming at her mum, you know. There you go. Uh, everything just adolescence just hits you as that. What I really liked was, and I found it quite good, was how suddenly at the same time the the old emotions all get woke up with the the delimission the delimission squad in there wrecking up the centre of our brain, you know, con- uh, ripping up the control centre, adding new button new buttons in, obviously for emotions. And how they just they says we're away for a tea break, that type of thing. And how yeah. key chaotic it was like a building site a chaotic building site and, and that is exactly what we were all like when we were, when it happened to us all we didn't know what was hitting us what these emotions were getting and i love and maya hawk who plays anxiety she was fantastic she, she was how, yeah you know how she sort of took over and that, that's what anxiety does i'm going to admit i still suffer from anxiety occasionally at times and it, it just hits you without you actually realizing it takes control of you and 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 how she says let's bottle up all the old memories emotions mm-hmm. and we'll put you down the side into the was it the museum like the the, the archive of, of riley's brain I, I loved that yeah they had to use a sort of the basics of the original plot to bring in the, the emotions that happened you know and then obviously create its own sort of monster if you like to say i liked how also at times where like she's playing the hockey game to show she's growing up, she's getting she's getting more competitive. You start to notice other people, especially the the girl who's seen as like the great. You know when they went to the, the hockey the hockey uh, uh, school for a, a vacation for a little bit, and as she went went to in, inspired by her, you know I liked that. But I also showed you confusion and confliction and how emotional and insecure really was i really liked that what i really liked was was the stream the the, the scene obviously the story of the emotions trying to get back they're on a quest and they have to yeah. float down the stream of consciousness and it's broken up by sarcasm i let people watch it and they'll understand the okay. sarcasm you know, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I just found that that was that, that that was absolutely great. As I said, there's a lot goes on in adolescence. Nothing, life is not straightforward, and as I said, yeah. also uh, anxiety is overpowering. And June Squibb is nostalgia. <laughs> she just kept popping. Oh my God, I love that. That was funny. I that, it. You know that that was one for the the mums and dads that might have been there as well. Any yeah. of the slightly older folk uh, people that. I mean, yeah, it's not perfect, but I think a lot of it was done deliberately because that's what life's like. Life's is not perfect. Yeah. If they were to do another one, what yeah, age could they go? I feel like it's so much to explore, though. Yeah. So I'm sort of wondering, should it be yeah. when she becomes an adult and it can maybe make it as a little short film and maybe put it hmm. onto one of the future Pixar or Disney movies that may work out? Because I know they tried it with Toy Story with the boy who had all the toys. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, I have to admit, I've not seen the last Toy Story movie, and so I'm I'm sort of just thinking of actually tell a lie. The last Toy Story is actually the existential Toy Story, which the yeah. other films actually should have been. You know, it's a bit like I'm going off Cartier, uh, Hellraiser, right? Or the Cinnab- Cinnabites. The first film is not about them, it's about the two characters, uh, the adults that we meet in there. The second mm. film is the actual about the about the, the creatures. So <laughs> what a film to use for a kids movie. And uh, so and this, you know, it's, uh, it's that type of thing, you know, the emotions. You could probably actually connect inside out to with the hitman because it's all about identity as well. It's her trying to find it's herself. So you know, it's yeah. quite a, a. You could actually connect the two of them together because if I remember rightly, I think the Hitman was a 12A. I might be wrong. And when it was released in the cinema, overall, I really, really did enjoy it. I really did yeah. enjoy it. I was surprised myself because it was so long between the two movies, and yeah. sometimes you wait that long and the uh, the buzz and for it gets really gets so hyped up, and then you see it and you go. That was the good. Yeah, you know? and I, I really appreciate how they, you know, took their time. Like, they didn't rush a sequel just because of the hype. And yeah. I think it shows that, like, the work that they put in was really worth it. Like, it was, like, the time was needed, basically. Yeah. But, yeah, 
I also really like how like Riley is not like perfect. Like her teeth yes. are crooked, like they're not straight, and she has to wear braces, and she has a little bit of skin like blemishes. And I think that's so cool. I I think a lot of the times we see teenagers in movies or TV shows, and they look so unrealistic. Yeah. They're played by all characters, and you know the yeah. skin is perfect, the teeth are perfect, but I think it's maybe one of the first times that I see like this portrayal on the big screen and I think it's so cool because it's very relatable right like it's something that I think we've all experienced and it feels yes a lot more real to see it like that yeah because uh, there was the same and she finally got to the where the the hockey school was and the girl that she idolized we start, came up and said yeah. hello to her, and she was she was like hypnotized and suddenly she starts talking about her hair and how great it is, yeah. you know. And, and obviously, that's sort of things that girls and they get older, they start to notice how their appearance is. And I mean, where I work at the airport, you know, a lot of young girls get, I mean, I'm, I'm a lot older and uh, a lot of the young girls are all talking about getting this perfume and all. I'm using this lip gloss, I'm using this. I work at an obviously, I work at Glasgow Airport and obviously, we have to walk through duty free when we're going up to board flights. And you know, no, oh, get this, get this. Oh, if you tried this one out, and or or if they're going for a night out, they're, they're all, yeah. Did you go to this shop to buy this? I bought these shoes. I bought this dress, and this and that. You know, you know. So it's, uh, it, that, that's probably the next stage we, we may see Riley at. You know, when she's more into her, her appearance and how her appears. She's gonna be boys. She's gonna be with girls. You know that type of thing. You know, that's if they do. That's probably the next one. But that, the the the, pro, the problem with that is is that she get into sort of fifteen categories and even higher than that. The Disney or Pixar want to go that far in, you know. So what was your final thoughts inside out to, and what rating would you give it? I think it's a very successful sequel. I'm very happy with it. I think sequels are hard. Like there's, you know, it's hardly ever the case that you prefer the sequel to the original. So I think that's already kind of like a win. Um. And I think Inside Out has the potential to like even do more, but we'll see. We'll see what they do with it. I think if done well, there is the potential for like more sequels because you can always add like emotion. You can always add parts of the mind. So that's that's what's really cool. It's like a board building. Yeah. I gave it four stars. Yeah, I'm the same. I give it four stars as well. Yep. Uh, it's been a weird year for big films, you know. As in the ones that maybe critically do well, like Furiosa, The Fall Guy, all mm-hmm. did really well, but they, they all critically did well. But for some weird reason, they're doing disappointing at the cinema. Yeah, yeah there is a lot of factors in there. You know, cinema is very expensive. And if you go mm-hmm. with families, that the kids want the popcorns, they want all the, the expensive snacks that you get at the airport. At the airport, I'm talking about my job here, mm-hmm. the cinema. They're, they're expensive at the airport as well, by the way. Uh, yes. You know, you know, so it's hard to say. Yeah, I think it, going with the films that Disney and Pixar have had out the past year, yeah, this is probably the best of the bunch uh, because Wish, I think Wish was the last one. That that was a bit of a myth for a lot of people. A lot of people didn't like it. Some people did like it, you know. So, yeah, I give it four stars. So, there you have it, folks. That four stars from both of us for Inside Out 2. So you have it, folks. That's uh, You had a couple of reviews. As I mentioned earlier on, it was a busy few weeks for both of us, uh, especially for you, Clotilda. You've been to two international film festivals, that Cannes and Sundance in London. Do you want to just tell us about uh, a few things about what films you've seen there? Maybe what what appeals you, especially with Cannes, because Cannes is not a festival where a lot of people like to go to. It's more seen yeah. as the, the, the high end, even like you see the big major newspapers and magazines. Tell us about some films that we may like to look forward to from these two festivals. Yeah, so Cannes is, is great, obviously. I did, however, miss on seeing Megalopolis at Cannes. I think, I don't know why, it seemed like they didn't have many screenings, but I didn't get to see it. So can't say much about that, but <laughs> there's something that I... Yeah, I, I mean, I heard things, but I didn't watch Yeah, that. I think we all did hear things. <laughs> right? But, yeah, there's something that I really liked. I think my favourite one overall is The Seed of the Sacred Pig, which okay. won the honorary film door, I want to say. And it's, I think, the film itself is obviously beautiful, 
there's some shots that I thought were amazing. And, and the story, of course, is, is very powerful and, and I think very important to tell. But it also goes together with the real life story behind the movie because just actually just before Khan started, the, the director was going to be arrested in Iran for this movie and he managed to escape to Europe. So I think knowing <laughs> as well the background behind that makes it even more urgent as a film. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I thought it was really cool because I don't think this is a spoiler, but there's a bit where, uh, because it shows um, the protests in Iran, and there's a part that's basically found footage or footage of the actual protest. And I think it's so powerful to see real footage of something that is actually happening. But oftentimes, you know, as, as I mentioned, Iran doesn't want this to be showed. So it's, I think it's a brave decision for him, but it's also so powerful because you see, just you know, it's a fiction movie with fiction characters and obviously very well studied shots and cinematography. And to just oppose that with some actual real footage and it's shaky and it's not perfect. And I think it's just a really powerful technique and it's not something that you see often either. So I really like how they did that. And I also really like Anora, which won the palm door, of yeah. course. And... Another one of my favorites was Fall to a Land Unknown, which is a crazy story as well, because they, I think they filmed in like over three or four months, which is crazy. Yes. Uh, they started shooting like in November and they were at Cannes. So that's... Wow, that's um, quick. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I really like these. I also watched All Canada and The Apprentice, which were like some of my most anticipated. And I quite like them. They didn't like love them, love them, but I think they're good. And I think they like, it will spark into interesting discussion, I think, once they come out. That's it for Cannes. And um, for Sundance London, obviously it's a, it's a smaller festival, I would say. Yes. Um, but I saw a few movies. Um, I think my favourite, like my absolute favourite was probably My Old Ass because uh-huh. I kind of went into it thinking it was a comedy, which it was, but it's also very emotional. It has some really like sweet and emotional moments, which... It's hard to balance with comedy, and I think the film does that really well. And it's it's about growing up and moving away from your family, which I think is just it's something that a lot of people will be able to relate to, and it's obviously very well made. So that made me cry. It was great. Loved it. I also yeah. really like your monster. Similarly, it's quite funny and also like emotional, and it has like this song that I think got stuck in everyone's head. It got stuck in my head. Like I couldn't. I kept thinking about it. <laughs> It's a really good film and it won the audience award. I think it's a bit like we said for him, and it's like something that can li- like be liked by various people because there's a bit of romance, there's a bit of comedy, there's a bit of horror even. So it's it's kind of that successful mix of genres that a lot of people I think are gonna like. And yeah, I also watched Kneecap, which was really good. I actually didn't realize this until the end of the film, but the actual people, you know, the actual kneecap band. Yes. They are playing themselves, and I, I just thought they found some matches that really, <laughs> but no. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's actually very really cool. I remember, sorry to interrupt, I remember back at the programme launch for the Glasgow Film Festival, the surprise mm-hmm. film is one of the big highlights. It's a big highlight for a lot of festivals that do it. When someone in, from the press asked if it was going to be kneecap. The, yeah. the 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 director of the festival uh, the, the the reaction we got we thought ah it might be because it it played obviously the main Sundance festival as yeah. well but it, it never ended up being drive away dolls so kneecap yep yeah, kneecap I just I just think that's absolutely crazy with the the guy with the the, tri- the Irish tricolor uh, schema yeah. and I didn't know a lot of the story so it was it was also really cool for me to kind of learn um obviously a lot of it is dramatized but it's it's yeah. such a fun film and you get to hear a lot of the music which obviously you, you kind of want to read this up. Um, yeah. but yeah I think Sunday's London was such a like a really good program I know it's like a smaller festival but they just it seems to me that they always made it with the with the selection um, yeah. I also watched Rob Beast and Girls Will Be Girls which are both really good I think they have like very different types of films and yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a really good selection I have to say I really liked it. And and I know they did a surprise film as well. I didn't go. And it was Times of Kindness, which I actually saw in Khan. So, in a way, it's a good thing I didn't go because I had a sitting already. <laughs> and I think it comes out this week. Yeah, well, we're recording this on the 20th of June. It's going to be a week today. 
27th of June. It's been a bit of a weird uh, marketing for it. There's never been a proper, like, if you like to say, a full-length uh, trailer for it. It's always been little 30-second no. trailers, just little teasers. But as you know, Clotilde, I'm not the biggest fan of L- L- Ligon Moss. Yeah. Do you think I'm going to like it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I that's what I thought. I think it's like, in many ways, it's very Lance Moss, yeah. in the sense that there's a lot of, like, the stuff you would associate with him. But at the same time, I think, for me, it was less impressive than, say, poor things, which I really liked, although I'm not, like, a big fan of Lanthimos. But I think it doesn't have the kind of, like, what I felt with poor things. It was, like, this kind of groundbreaking and very exciting narrative that, like, you know, sets it apart. And I think for Kinds of Kindness, is more like, you know, what Lanthimos does well in a nutshell. But to me, it was missing a bit of, like, the excitement or something new um so that's me i didn't love it i didn't hate it it's a good film but i don't think i don't think if you don't really like lance i don't think you're gonna like it yeah yeah so where can people read the reviews that you've done for these two festivals and there are films that you have seen you haven't mentioned yes so actually i think i reviewed almost all the films that i've seen at both festivals crazy um, or I will have reviewed all of them eventually at uh, some point this month. But um, a lot of them are allowed in peer reviews for both festivals. Yeah. And I also reviewed some films for The Independent and for yeah. Movie Marker, for the people's movies, of course. Of course, of course, um, yes. Thank you for those. And <laughs> I've got a couple of reviews for Next Best Pictures and Movies We Tested. I think that's all of them. If I forgot any, I'm really sorry. No, no, that's not at all, but thank you very much for doing that. Now you go, there's a little roundup of Sundance London and Cannes. It's a wrap for your episode 31 of The Chronicle. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Clotilda, for joining us again. Thank you very much, Netflix and also Disney Pixar for letting us review the movies. The Hitman streaming on Netflix. You might find it in the odd cinema, as in Inside Out 2. You'll find it at your local cinemas. Obviously, as I said at the beginning of the episode, we have changed how we host the podcast. So that's sort of one of the reasons why I took a few weeks off for now. The Chronicle's now on Podbean. What I will do, actually, is give the podcast a bit of a wider scope. When I mention you'll find the Chronicle on many of the popular sites to download your favourite podcast, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, we're still on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Player FM, Samsung, Podchaser, Boomplay, Castbox, to name a few. So there you go, there's a big, big difference in this episode will be on name. Clotilda, as in the social media, would you like to let the, the listeners know where they can find you on social media? So I'm at the personal being Chloe on Instagram and at students with Chloe on Twitter and Let. That's great, thank you very much. As in for the Chronicle and the People's Movies, you'll find us on Facebook at the People's Movie, at X or Twitter, or it's X as it's called now, at the People's Movie, over at Instagram at the People's Movies, pen interest at TPM underscore UK. Sometimes we may continue the, the chat over at the Chronicle Take Two, so stay tuned on social media and at, at the website to find out about your future uh, episodes. You can also sign up for our little email newsletter and join the seven and a half thousand people who do follow us on the newsletter. You'll find the link over at the People's Movies. Just give us your email and every time we post something, you'll find out then. You can also show your support for the Chronicle and the People's Movies at Buy Me A Coffee and at PayPal. All the links are actually on the website. Obviously, now we're on a lot of more places where you can uh, share the podcast obviously on your social media, share it with your friends and family. And those podcast websites that you've listened to this episode from, please do leave us a like and leave us a little rating as well. Thank you very much, Clotilda, for joining us. And we'll see you the next time. And obviously for you guys, thank you very much for joining us again. Until the next time, enjoy the movies.